Okay, now I'm not an expert at this, I'm not an academic, I'm an ordinary teacher from South London, so I hope, I'm sure there are people in this room who will have lots of contributions to make, um, and have probably got ideas and know things that I uh, don't. But I've really enjoyed reading for this, I must say, and a book, I hope it is in the uh, bookshop, I would highly recommend, if anyone is interested, a book by Angela Woolacott on the munitions workers in the First World War. And I am sort of um, unashamedly going to really talk a lot about what is contained in, in her really interesting study. Now, I'll start by saying, I mean, Trotsky talked about war as the motor of history. And really what I want to try and argue in this meeting is that the war, the experience of women in the First World War, actually did undoubtedly strike a very, very important blow against what uh, Engels called the primeval prejudice that existed in the British establishment towards women, particularly to the question of women's suffrage. Now, certainly on the eve of the First World War, Britain had experienced and had had the biggest feminist movement, really, uh, of its time in the suffrage and suffrage, uh, suffragists' uh, campaign for the vote. Um, since from uh, 1847, I mean, there wasn't a year really that went pa past in Parliament where suffrage wasn't discussed, female suffrage. In every home, in every town, in every industry, particularly, obviously, most famously amongst the Lancashire, uh, cotton workers, female suffrage was really a key issue. Uh, but on the other hand, so you'd had this massive discussion, this massive debate, unprecedented, and I will come back to it towards the end, some quotes really from some of the discussions that took place in Parliament. Um, you had a ruling class in Britain who were violently opposed to any form of the emancipation of women. And uh, also, I think it's important to say that on the eve of war, the position of women in terms of work, and I am predominantly going to talk about the experience of women uh, in work in the First World War, because the rates of employment of women went up 555%. By the end of the war, from a position of one million, you had seven and a half women, million women in regular employment. This was unprecedented. There's never been such huge numbers of women brought in to um, the organised um, workforce. And indeed, Millicent Fawcett, uh, after the war, said that the war had found women slaves, uh, serfs, and had left them free. So it's really around that that I want to uh, focus. Now, women's position was unfavourable. Most, I mean, we know that very large numbers of women, over a million women, were employed in domestic service at the beginning of the war. But women's work was very segregated uh, from men. It was mainly where women did work in industry, it was industries that serviced uh, the retail sector, you know, millinery, hat uh, makers, uh, matchmakers, you know, obviously the, the, the example of those, but women were predominantly in separate industries from men. They were very, very poorly uh, paid, and most women, certainly any middle class women, were expected to give up work once uh, they had married. Now, once you have the, on, the beginnings of the war, you have th thousands of women middle-class women, I'm going to talk about first, who volunteer in their thousands to work for the war effort. Now, for middle-class women to go into work, and 80,000 uh, women were non-combatants in the First World War. And these were women who had been brought up in households where really servants performed all the domestic tasks I mean, anyone who's read uh, Vera Britton's Testament of Youth, or even if you watched, I didn't particularly like it, that programme, Crimson Fields, you get the sense, you know, that here were thousands of middle-class women who had never ironed their own clothes, let alone uniforms 
uh, you know, the nurses' uniforms they were expected to wear. They'd never boiled an egg. They didn't know how to make a fire. They'd been used to a situation where domestic servants performed all the domestic tasks. And yet 80,000 of these women suddenly found themselves working in uh, the support services, the non-combatants, things like the Wrens, the Wax, uh, the Red Cross nurses. And indeed, when you think about the First World War, most of us think about the battles taking place within the confines of the trenches. And, you know, I've taken my students over to France. You go and you see that the trenches are literally no further away than this room. But actually, behind those were vast acres and acres, you know, miles and hundreds and thousands of miles, yeah, in which millions of people serviced the front line as, and many of these were women, as, um, you know, as ambulance drivers, as train drivers, as van drivers, in the nursing uh, field, uh, on the battlefields, right up really to the front line. And so there is a wealth, and it is incredibly moving, you know, there is a wealth of uh, history written by these women, of, of which Vera Britton's is probably, I think, the most affecting, where really you had women who were working in the most appalling conditions. And I listened to an interview of Shirley Williams talking about it, and she makes a really good point. You know, these women were working on amputations in muddy fields, in the most horrific conditions. Women, you know, um, patching up the destruction of war, and these were women who probably never even seen, and they never seen a male body naked in their entire life, and yet they were administering in the most, you know, I mean, distressing ways to the mutilations and the horrors of war. And it's no doubt that that had enormous effect, a personal and emotional, you know, terrible effect on on those on those women. It changed, but it did. It changed, and undoubtedly changed their lives. But also on the home front, I mean, many middle class women had to step in to fill in the, you know, the vacancies that had been left by their husbands, brothers and fathers. They went into things like retail, banking, brewing. Many of them started to run the companies or manage the companies that the, you know, as they were replacing um, the men that went to the front. And by 1917, women replaced one in three men in all of these industries. However, I am going to talk mostly, as I said, about the, um, the, the biggest growth of women's employment, which was really the munitions. And if you want to get a sense, I mean, over uh, almost a million women went into the munitions industry predominantly, almost exclusively, as, as workers, working class women. And if you want to get a sense of just, you know, how the effect or the, the size of this, if you take, for instance, the example of Woolwich Arsenal, which was the largest um, munitions factory in the world at the time, in 1914, it employed 14,000 men no women at all, but by 1918 there were 100,000 workers, of which 50% of them, exactly 50% of them, were women. And these were huge industrial workplaces. Now, certainly, one of the effects of this for women was that women's wages, women for the first time, working class women, <coughs> whereas service had been very servile, um, you know, very low paid, suddenly women were able to earn their own independent income through regular work, which was very, very well paid. I mean, at the beginning of the war, the average salary for a, a munitions uh, worker was 10 shillings. By the end, it was 30. Two pounds uh, was quite common at the end of the Second World War, and for supervisors, women supervisors in the munitions factories could be earning as much as uh, £3. Now, it was 
not on equal pay to what men had previously earned, and food, fuel and fuel, fuel, food and fuel prices rose by 100%, but it still left women two-thirds better off working class women than they had previously been uh, before uh, the war started. Now, we know that economic independence brings as well some uh, an increase in status and some uh, social liberation. And actually, because these munitions factories were considered to be really the first stop, the first point of the machine of death, what you see, and I think Angela Woolacott makes this point very strongly in her book, is that actually these women had a very important social role. And you only have to look at some of the posters, and I've just sort of photocopied just a couple, couple of them. But, I mean, this was one of the most um, prolific posters. It was the most common poster, and it was the slogan, On Her, Their Lives Depend. And the munitions girls were seen, I mean, they were called Tommy's sister. And, you know, Tommy was the mythical uh, guy who, you know, the, who signed up, volunteered for the war. But the fact that you had these women on a par with men, yeah, in terms of the important role that they performed, and all of the posters, if you look at them and uh, you can see them on the internet, always show the munitions girls and the soldier, you know, in the background. The same here. These women are doing their bit. You know, there was a great um, increase in the importance. Women had never been told, ever, that their work was important in previous history. But for the first time, these girls were seen as the first and most important on that treadmill uh, to the death, uh, the war uh, machine. So, and it really, I mean, I think I'd compare it. I mean, when you think about Rosie the Riveter, the image of the woman in the Second World War, that was the personification, really, at that time, of female modernity and really the munitions girls uh, that had started with the munitions girls, women, they were called girls at that time, really in the First uh, World War. Gone was the deference. That's really important. And the idea which had dominated uh, British society that women in some way needed to be protected by men, here they were doing an enormously important bit for the war. But also, I just like, um, you know, the fact, and lots of people made the point about it, that actually what women looked like changed. Here you have women, they are wearing uniforms too. The uniform, the pictures of the women in uniform, was very important part of the kind of propaganda. You see, I haven't got them here, the land girls, the typical image we have of them is them wearing trousers and shorts. Women cut their hair uh, because you know it was easier. Actually, it was you didn't you weren't able to have hairpins, obviously, because everything all metal had to go towards the war effort. But most importantly, and actually really good for her, no corsets. You know the corsets disappeared. They were dangerous in the munitions factories anyway. Yeah, I mean, a woman wearing a corset was a human hand grenade, uh, but also, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, they needed it for the guns, etc. So, you know, immediately, women look different. The whole image, if you think about it, you know, we got images of before, uh, was very, very uh, different. Also, you know, the munitions factories weren't built where there was spare labour. I mean, the, the decisions about where the munitions factories were built was based on security. So, for again, for a whole generation of women, I mean, the, they had to move miles and miles away from home. And anyone, I mean, you know, I can remember moving away from home a long time ago. Liberation. You didn't have your mum prying on you, didn't have your neighbours and your auntie Kitty looking out for what you were doing. I mean, these women, middle class women, and I'll talk about their role in the munitions, they also, you know, had never been able to be out previously without some kind of cha chaperone. So suddenly you have thousands of women, 
moving away from home, hostels were built in the towns where the munitions factories were, and these women experienced a level of female camaraderie that actually, again, had really been previously uh, un. Uh, precedented. The, uh, they moved into hostels, people talked with some concern about the fact that women started smoking, <laughs> women were in control of their own leisure, it's the first time you hear about women visiting pubs, because remember pubs were the places near the factories where me really people went for lunch, so you had a completely social change for these women. Now, but, however, I don't want to over-glamorise or glorify it because it wasn't all wonderful. This was hard, arduous, dangerous work. Women stood and worked on 12-hour uh, shifts. Were the, I mean, they called, the, they, obviously they worked with explosives like TNT and the women, the girls, were often called canaries. They were nicknamed canaries in the local areas because you could tell a woman who worked in the munitions because her skin was yellow and her hair was orange from the poison of uh, the TNT. There were countless accidents um, and I think there was, someone told me there was a, 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 a television program about it which I've completely missed about the danger of the work that the women were involved in. I mean at least, but it was covered up, the government covered up a lot of the accidents, but there were at least 400 uh, women during the course of the First World War who died. Uh, they were targets uh, for the Zeppelins. Um, there were thousands of countless women maimed and injured, which was never recorded uh, by the government. Though it is interesting, on some occasions there were almost militaristic <coughs> funerals for the women, and some of the munitions women did win medals of victory for, uh, you know, an explosion would take place in a factory and within minutes the women would be back in the factory uh, working. So they received, uh, you know, medals of honour and very often they were uh, buried in milit military type funerals with uh, the Union Jack and a military guard uh, to honour them. But also, inside the factories themselves, it was really a very militaristic uh, regime. I mean, interestingly, all of them were known by their number and not their names. Uh, I said they had to wear um, uniforms. There were constant protestations um, to work harder. You know, you were working for the war effort. The men's lives depended on how fast and how hard uh, you um, could work. It was dirty, it was hard, it was physically, um, you know, uh, f physically uh, damaging. But also, the women had, remember, you know, the double burden uh, for women. Women who were parents also, you know, often had to travel long distances to work on very crowded and sometimes dangerous uh, transport. They were going home to homes I mean, there'd been big strikes uh, on the, in the building trade prior to the First World War. I mean, no houses had been built or um, repaired, really, in the four years running up to the First World War because of the strikes. So women went back to unsanitary conditions where there was no uh, running hot water or heating, um, no inside uh, toilets. Often these women, and you know, uh, Angela Woolicott talks about it, how, you know, a rumour would go round that there was meat in a butcher other than manky old sausage, and you know, the women would come out of the munitions factories and run to get to the places where the butcher was still selling meat, and would have to queue up for hours, uh, you know, for the rations, uh, uh, you know, uh, to take home. So, obviously, for work, you know, for women, particularly mothers, it was a very, very arduous um, existence. Now, also, uh, you know, the, the freedom can be idealised, but it caused a moral panic. This had always happened. It happened from the match girl strike. There was always a, uh, a ruling class obsession or concern 
about the moral degeneration of women who would be working in an industry uh, together. And so in the, the Munitions Act was passed in 1915, which really brought about three really important things. Firstly, there were tribunals, um, there were courts, there were munitions courts inside the factories where girls would be fined for things like lateness or absence. So women whose children were sick or women who couldn't get because of domestic responsibilities, etc., would be fined as much as five shillings, you know, which was a horrendous amount when you consider that they were working, uh, you know, that they were working 20. They would be fined for skiving, you know, if you took too long in the toilet. You know, if you couldn't find your overall or your uniform because your mate had hidden it for a joke or somebody who didn't like you had hidden it for a joke, you would be fined for skiving uh, on the job. And actually, you know, again, Angela Wallacott talks about the terror of working class girls going into these courts where they were faced with, you know, a layer of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the male managers who were still running the factories and some of, I'll talk about the welfare supervisors who worked there as well, where they came out of the courts and they couldn't even, they didn't even know what they'd been fined because they were so scared um, of, uh, you know, the, the whole atmosphere in these courts. You had to have leaving certs, uh, certificates, in order to move or leave a munitions uh, factory. If another employer hired you without a leaving cert, uh, that was, they were fined uh, for doing that. And nobody without a leaving cert could claim any kind of benefit or uh, poor relief if the employer hadn't given them, sorry, the um, cert to leave. But also, there was an employment of a layer of middle-class welfare uh, supervisors. These were, were actually the forerunners of the female uh, police force, and one employer described them as a force to dispel the gathering clouds of discontent. They were really a female police force within a female uh, environment, and they were resisted and resented uh, you know, enormously. Um, they not only uh, patrolled and, you know, uh, supervised women's uh, work, uh, it, it was their job to make sure that the women were working as fast and effectively as, is, as was possible, but they also um, policed them in their private lives. So they would often be found in parks, rummaging around the bushes, looking for uh, a couple in an embrace. Uh, you know, they, there's examples in Angela Woolicott's book, book of where they find a couple down an alleyway and then there's a, a fight uh, between the munitions girl uh, and the supervisor. But they really were the forerunner for a whole strand of women's welfare work which really developed after uh, the First World War, which I will talk about a bit later. But also, I think what's really important, and really, you know, as I say, Millicent Fawcett particularly talked about the enormous impact of uh, women uh, going into uh, work on the scale, on this scale, for the first time. Trade unionism amongst women uh, escalate, uh, you know, grew. Uh, enormously. I mean, 45% uh, trade unionism during the First World War rose by 45% overall. For women, it was 160%. Uh, and indeed, even where women stayed in the traditional areas of dressmaking and uh, hat makers, this is where you see the beginnings of those trade unionisms in those very, the, the, the origins of uh, trade unionism in what were, you know, kind of um, exclusively women's areas of work. And um, certainly I will say that lots of people at the time made the point that right across Britain, women just carried themselves differently. They looked different, 
their status had enhanced their self-esteem and self-concept. And certainly women, despite all the uh, problems, uh, had uh, uh, a very, very important status. Now I'll say obviously, well not obviously, but the war comes to an end and there is really both a public and a personal acceptance by and large that women were a stopgap uh, in the workforce. There is passed in 1919 a uh, piece of legislation called the Restoration of Pre-War Practices Act. And this was a piece of legislation which basically said that any woman had to move out of her post if a man came back from the front and needed that job. Over a million women left uh, you know, uh, industrial production between the end of the war and the passing of the Act. And obviously the slump in war production also uh, meant that you know, there weren't the same amount of jobs that had, there had been during the war. But also there was an enormous ideological onslaught. I mean, women were described as bread snatchers, women who tried to maintain their jobs, or as limpets. I should say there was opposition. I mean, on the London trams, there were strikes by male and female workers against the against getting rid of women uh, in the workforce. In Liverpool, um, in Glasgow, the trade union movement did try and oppose the mass uh, movement of women out of the workforce, partly because people recognised there were so many, so many more single parents, single women, who had no recall to a man's um, wage. But there was really uh, a great, I mean, I can't remember who it was, but somebody really talks about how this, after the First World War, there was the birth of what you'd call the idealised domesticity, the idealised family home, because there was a lot of pressure for women to return back to their previous roles, supposedly, as mothers and housewives. It was an ideological, but it was based in, on real material uh, conditions. And what the government did was, in 1915, it did pump large amounts of money into things like maternity services, the training of midwives, the training of, uh, of health visitors. There were classes for women on um, you know, basic hygiene standards, um, how to counteract common uh, medical conditions, you know, uh, in the home. And it was based on, uh, really, uh, the real experience of women. That a, thou a, a thousand women a year died in Britain during the First World War of maternal complications, yeah? I mean, the infant mortality rate was 12 a day in most of the major cities uh, in London. And so women welcomed, I mean, all women, working class women, welcomed, and it, you know, it welcomed attention to this very, very debilitating aspect of, of their lives. And in the 1918, as I say, Maternity and Child Welfare Act really gave women the charge of repairing the physical and intellectual wastage of uh, the war. And it's not surprising that both men returning from the war and women who had, you know, had experienced both some form of liberation but also some arduous personal circumstances wanted to see a place where domesticity could replay a role. Just an interesting fact, uh, you know, which nobody really talks about and I'm, I'm going to read a bit more. You know, the fact that 12 million letters a week went from Britain to uh, the Western Front. You know, soldiers rereading and rereading the, the, the letters from their wives at home. Wives and children writing furiously to the men that, that had departed. And people wanted at the end of the war a better life, a better home life and personal life for them. Uh, and their family. Now, you know, I haven't got a, a lot more time, so I want to really focus, you know, on what I started really, 
to a large extent was uh, the impact of the First World War on the question of female uh, suffrage. And I should say, actually, not only, I mean, 1919, I mean, I'm going to say this, the, the, the vote is granted to women over the age of 30 in 1918. I mean, based on property and marital uh, status. Uh, the government couldn't conceive of any situation where a woman who didn't have a husband uh, should be able um, to vote. There was great concern that these women uh, below the age of 30 would be much too frivolous, uh, wouldn't really, uh, you know, uh, know what they were doing. But most importantly, also, remember, you had had uh, the Russian Revolution, you'd had 1916 in Ireland, the ferment of discontent. So there was concern <laughs> that many of these single girls would, wouldn't, I mean, would vote the wrong way, really, you know, that they would be um, lured by uh, the, the lure of um, the Labour Party. But the vote is given, it doesn't, we don't get equal <coughs> suffrage till 1928. Uh, but certainly, I would argue that the role that women performed in the First World War was something that really swept away so much of the uh, prejudice that had existed um, before. I mean, it just was not possible for men. And I'm just going to read, I mean, you know, a very typical, I mean, Paul Foote has a whole chapter in his book on the vote. And, you know, he said, you know, he's got... Uh, quote after quote of what men thought about women when the question of suffrage came up in Parliament and just one you know one uh, MP in the House of uh, in the, in, in the uh, government at the time says I have always objected to petticoat government I have always observed that ladies for whom I have the biggest respect and admiration are incapable of argument I mean one MP <laughs> talks about women's brains melting I mean it does I haven't got that kind of here uh, with um, the uh, strain of having uh, to debate issues of, um, you know, issues of government. They just could not argue this again after the First World War. Indeed, you know, many middle class women went in from uh, the factory um, supervisors positions, went in to run the services like health visiting, nursing and the education boards. And they did as well, if not better, than men. So they'd already, already been, both amongst the middle class and working class, you know, a massive, massive change. It was just unthinkable that they could argue that kind of prejudice um, afterwards. And also, obviously, the value of the work that the women had done. The fact that I would really say, you know, I mean, Britain was one of the last, you know, uh, Western countries really to grant the vote, decades after uh, places uh, like New Zealand, and that the experience of women at work had really made that possible. Now also, I mean, I think it's important to say, you know, women, you know, some women did go back into the home. For middle class women and for women who were single, it wasn't really a possibility. I mean, you know, they, they were the only breadwinners, it, but they had joined trade unions. You get the beginning of, uh, you know, an important strand of women in trade unions. Women had established that they could work in industries that had previously been unthinkable. So I want to really end by saying, I think a, a very important blow was struck for uh, struck against the notion uh, against the primeval sexism that Engels had talked about, and that yes, I'll leave it there. No. I'm Julia, I'm a journalist working in Sheffield, and part, half of my job is doing this thing called Retro, which is like a nostalgia supplement really but it's been fascinating because uh, obviously all this year people have been sending I mean the welter of stuff we've had about the First World War from readers has been absolutely phenomenal um, some of the letters and postcards right. I've seen have actually seen and handled letters and postcards yeah. from people
And there was one, there was one family where there were really, really weird sort of things that they wrote on. Hey, the bloke, the bloke, obviously, I mean, obviously there wasn't a shop down a corner shop at the trenches. So any postcard he could get, anything he could write on, he wrote on, you know, all sorts of mad things. And uh, you know, obviously, the the, the the connection between people was important. I, you know, I really found that. But um, the munitions work, Sheffield was a massive munitions workers mm. uh, area because of the steelworks uh, and the heavy engineering there. Companies like uh, uh, Thomas Furs, Camel Laird. There's about five or six major companies in Sheffield who just like it was. Wow, it was it was a bonanza for them. They just made huge amounts of money, and they had to pull in huge amounts of women workers as well. And uh, you know, uh, um, I was I was um, reading a piece written by somebody about they were told about their great grandma, I think it was another grandma, and uh, she called Laura Lockwood, and she uh, she works in a munitions factory, and uh, she was walking home one night, you know, obviously quite late on, and that, and suddenly there was a zeppelin raid. Yeah. In 1916 yeah. was a zeppelin raid on Sheffield, um, and uh, they, she saw the places get she saw the munition factories getting bombed, and she was lucky she wasn't there at the time, but. You know, it was that, that thing mm. that they, she saw what was happening, you know, it just obviously did change those women's lives. And in Sheffield, my, the paper I worked for has had this campaign called Women of Steel to try and get um, uh, a statue put up, basically, to women who worked in those industries in the First and Second World War. You know, and it, it, and it, it was, a, you know, as you say, it was horrendously tough and stuff, yeah. but you can see how it did, like, open women's yeah. lives up, yeah. you know, in places like Sheffield where... Uh, it was the same, mostly women were in service and what have you, and uh, just absolutely fascinating. I'd just like to ch thank Jan, it was a very, very interesting talk, and I mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Hello, I'm Sheila, um, from Leeds. Um, I was just going to talk about, really, I thought that were a fascinating talk. I think you should write your own book. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I think you should. Um, I thought I knew a lot about that, but I didn't until you spoke. But what I have been reading about um, is uh, the suffragettes, in yeah. particular mm -hmm. Sylvia yeah. Pankhurst. Yeah. And she's not... The stuff that she is one that is also uh, yeah. a very strong woman, and she did, and she and she's not recognised, I don't think, yeah. for what, for what she really did, um, because of her family, I suppose. But she, it's, there's a book at the moment in bookmarks, a small book. Uh, people should pick that yeah. up. But um, my mother uh, was in the Second World War, and uh, she, they all went into factories and whatever they were, you know, around. And it did toughen them up, because they had to raise the children on their own if the men were, were away, uh, and so on and so forth. And I just think the, the, the blossoming of women from the First World War, then you go on to the Second World War, you know, which we're not talking about now, but, you know, I have to talk about my experience of my mother and my grandmother and so on. It's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, and it gives women so much confidence. And it's like with the trade unions, you know, when there were closed shops in tailoring. My mother were in tailoring. Closed shops. You had to be in a union. You couldn't be employed unless you were in a union. And people did stick together, uh, men and women. Miners' strike. Look at the, my, you know, what happened in the 84 miners' strike. You know, the women kept that strike going. The daughters, the nieces, the wives, the partners, and it created problems in the end because women didn't want to go back to the house and be a, a housewife. They want, they found their independence. Some of them ended up le splitting up with the partners afterwards, writing books, being artists. Unbelievable stuff, and it's it's all come, if you like, from then. I know there's been blips in between, but generally speaking. It's all come from them, is you get them together to fight on something, and it's the same in factories. They're like a rabid dog. <laughs> They're much more rabid than men are. I can tell you that because I've been on strike myself. You know, get out of my face. You know, it's a bit like that. So I just wanted to compliment, really, what Jan was saying. Um, yeah, sorry, just going off a bit about what you were saying about um, the whole notion of yeah, when. You know, as revolutionaries, we think about being the um, the tribunes of the oppressed, and then in a you know revolution, it's almost become like a festival of the oppressed. But actually, in a way, that's why when oppressed people like women or or LGBT people or whatever <coughs> do come to the forefront, actually they can be some of the hardest fighters. And you think about some of the stories of the Russian Revolution, yeah. actually, and the way in which women really um, came to the forefront, and when they got um, organized 
um, that, you know, through a lot of the sort of on the ground stuff that the Bolsheviks did around trying to get women involved in um, setting up communal childcare centres and that sort of thing, um, going and getting educated at like loads of different mini Marxisms, that sort of thing. Um, it was often said that, you know, the women that would go and get active would be the biggest threat to anyone who was um, a former, uh, a supporter of the former regime or um, anyone who's counter revolutionary. Um, but anyway, sorry, I have a bit of a question as well, um, and I missed the beginning of your talk, sorry. Uh, but it's really about women and the anti-war movement, um, because I know in, in Germany, uh, you know, Clara Zetkin and Rosa Luxemburg were absolutely at the forefront of uh, challenging, uh, breaking from the SPD and, and organising um, on the ground uh, an anti-war movement. I know Sylvia Pankhurst as well stood out uh, against the war and obviously I can imagine it was a very difficult situation in that time when there were material it was a material urgency really to be able to feed and clothe and keep things going but I just w wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more as far as actually women's involvement in the anti-war movement. Yeah just two things, I'll come back to that one in a minute. I mean the, it's contradictory isn't it? Capitalism creates war and out of war we get women's liberation. And this process is going on today, I've just read a really interesting book about women's lives in China today where millions of women are getting sucked out of rural communities mm. in China into exactly these situations. Huge factories that produce everything that we have, living in hostels, in mm. dire conditions, fined and policed, and it's exactly the same experience a hundred years on. Mm. And capitalism is creating another huge working class in China, which will become, we hope, a grave digger for capitalism as well. Uh, but, and changing mm. lives, because these women expect to send all their money home that they get, they're hanging on to some, they're getting some independence, they're refusing to go back, and lives are being changed. And it's exactly the same process. And uh, I just think, you know, the, every aspect of capitalism is a problem for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that. that it, the World War I was a problem for workers, mm -hmm. because so many bloody died. Uh, but actually out of it there were, there were these benefits. And one of the things I'm involved in at the moment is uh, the Chesterfield Stop the War Coalition has put in a lottery bid for some of this money for World War War heritage. For £10,000 we've asked, and we didn't think we'd get, and we want to look at where war resistors. Uh, and they said, okay, we like your first bit, okay. then you have 20,000 pages to fill in. So we filled in the bid, and uh, we've got the local poet laureate, we've got a drama and a, a musician, uh, people who work in schools, and we're going to do research the war resistors and then they're going to take it into schools in a drama and a music and poetry. Uh, so I hope we get the money. But what's interesting is actually the conference, we're having to find local heritage to hang it round. But the conference where the suffragettes split over the war was in Buxton, which isn't that yeah. far away from us. Yeah. Uh, but interestingly, the woman who's written from Leeds, whose name I've forgotten, who wrote the, the book on the, the big book on the suffragettes who spoke at Marxism, says that all this stuff is in the LSE library and not really researched. The conference isn't um. known about, so we're having to find out about it. But if people don't know, Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, you know, the founder of the suffragettes, decided that there would be no more fight for the suffrage whilst the war was on. Absolutely pro-war and absolutely vicious towards the people who continued to oppose the war. And one of them was her own daughter, Sylvia, that Sheila was talking about. And uh, what was interesting about Sylvia was also that she moved away from a very middle-class approach to, to the suffrage, to understanding actually that it was through work, that the working class women were going to be the key, the women who were being pulled into, into the munitions. Because actually, the letters home told you about the horror, and that's, although it's true there was a lot of jingoism and people volunteered at the beginning of the war, by the time there was conscription yeah. uh, halfway through, uh, uh, 18 months later, mm -hmm. actually and people were seeing the horror, the anti-war movement begins to kick in. And uh, there's another story, a little village called Kreitsch, near us, where the independent Labour Party, again a split from the Labour Party that stayed, that was anti-war, tried to hold a meeting uh, to oppose conscription and uh, it was basically broken up by 200 women. Yeah? So we have to remember that there were lots of women who were very, very pro-war, the white feathers, mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were uh, unable to continue with their meeting uh, and literally chased out of town. Uh, so this is another thing that the drama teacher is really interested in. She wants to, she likes conflict, so she <laughs> wants the kids to, to, which side would you be on? She's yeah. going to pose for them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, 
there's a woman who's written a play about German aliens. Because all Germans who were living in Britain were d described as aliens in World War One, And there was a, a family who had been in, in Chesterfield for two generations, who ran a butcher's shop, and again, the outbreak of war, the shop is trashed, uh, the family have to move, and, and this was her grandma. So, you know, I think there are all sorts of things that, you know, that's hidden from history stuff mm -hmm. we need to know, but yeah. we need to remember the big picture, that actually the, the ruling class think they have it their own way, but actually through the contradictions of, 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 of capitalism, things can change. I just wanted to add a couple of points, really, because um, what Jan's concentrated on quite rightly is the transformation of women in terms of the role of work. But actually, for example, a lot of people think about Rape Clyde side, they think about the mm. shipyards and they think about the engineers and all the rest of it. One aspect of Red Clyde side was actually the rent strikes yeah. in Glasgow, which mm -hmm. were enormously important mm -hmm. in terms of the impact they had in leading to development of social housing yeah, in this yeah. country, the development of council housing. Mary Barber and Govan and the, the, the women's army that really, and it's the women's army because it was the women that led the rent strikes, absolutely clearly. Um, it did actually provoke the question though for me, because I, I don't actually know, um, in 1917 when you had the big shop stewards movement and you had the engineers strikes, what involvement would women have inside of that movement? Because um, you know, all I know about it is uh, you know, the engineers, I don't actually know the extent to which women were involved inside of that. Now people have quite rightly pointed out that you, know, that you, have, you have to understand the sort of how, way that the massive transformation that took place and a result of you know the war as a result of people who initially been enormously pro-war and the tran and, and how you had a huge huge transformation through the war turning into huge waves of opposition to the war and that had lots of contradictory effects because I'm, I'm doing a meeting later on disability aspect of this and um, but what I wanted to stress about it in this stage was that after the war lots of uh, servicemen came back for the war they weren't all left wingers by any means some of them were deeply reactionary nationalistic patriotic organisations were promoted by the ruling class across Europe in order to try and divide the workforce which had actually forged all these uni uh, united uh, bonds and so on that, that, that Jan mentioned. But there was an organisation in Britain called the Federation of Discharged and Demobilised Sailors and Soldiers which is essentially an ex-servicemen's organisation, which was deeply reactionary. They actually fought to get women out of the factories with much of the sort of slogans that uh, Jan had mentioned, actually. Um, however, on the other hand, that actually led and inspired uh, the National March of the Blind in 1920, a very, very important uh, development, which led to uh, the development eventually of blind workshops, which became later the Remploy workshops, incidentally, in Britain, mm -hmm. uh, which we know a bit about today. So these are very de deeply contradictory movements, and lots of the changes that took place took place partly as a result of polarisation against the war, and sometimes polarisation inside the movements opposed to the war as well. Incidentally, one of the books which is brilliant in all this stuff um, is um, Rodney Dangerfield's book, um, The Strange Death of Liberal yeah. England, which yeah. deals with this area yeah. as well. It's an absolutely fabulous yeah. book and a great read on this yeah. uh, very same subject. Um, I'm just wanting to ask you a quick question. Um, you know, like you said, obviously the ladies only got jobs in like 1917. I was just wondering what they were doing in like 1914-15 because obviously the British were involved in the war then so who was like replacing their jobs then when they obviously went away and when they were like doing the midwifery courses and stuff was there like rules about who could do that and who couldn't because like who was looking after the children if they were on courses or in work and while the men were away so thanks. Uh, firstly, I think to the first question, yes, the, most of the munitions factories built creches and nurseries. I mean, you don't want to exaggerate because it, it wasn't enough for all of the women. Women still fell back, and I think it partly answers the last question. Working class women always fell back on other working class women for childcare. I mean, to be honest, m most of them still do today. The cost of childcare is so prohibitive that you have grandmothers, sisters, um, you know, women paying for, uh, you know, child, what, we, what, what you'd call child minders. I mean, women, mothers who travelled to work in the munitions factories long distances, paid, 
or you know got other female older female members of the family to provide childcare but it was very important and it was a very important argument that the state could be seen to provide the kind of social supports that women needed. And obviously, just like it was repeated in the Second World War, nobody talked about the damage that this would do uh, to children. You know, suddenly all of that kind of mythology about only the woman can do it, it, it disappears during war and things are provided. I mean, also just the beginnings of canteens. I mean, I made the point actually in factory work up to the First World War, lunch always really took place in the local pub. Um, it was really the establishment, because they wanted to stop women going to the pub, so they built canteens in the munitions factories, and they remained afterwards, partly also, again, because there had been a recognition, and I think this is important, about the terrible state that the first conscripts were in, mentally, physically, health-wise, at the beginning of the First World War. And that did play in to all the, um, you know, the uh, funding and the ideology about creating a safe, hygienic, domestic sphere where many of these kind of disabilities and health problems could be eliminated. It was, you know, it worked for the ruling class to pour money into those services. I mean, we still have them today, to be honest. I always get, well, no, I mean, it's a long time ago since I had my children, but I was actually shocked when I had my children how much there is of the NHS that supports women through the birth, through the pregnancy, through the birth, and in the aftermath. That came out of um, the First World War. Um, also, uh, you know, an another point I think is that, I mean, people asked about uh, Sylvia Pankhurst. The small book you're talking about is the book, the purple book by Mary Davis, and I do uh, really, you know, recommend it. I mean, partly, you know, women split, you know, bourgeois women, Emily and Sylvia Pankhurst, went with the war effort with enthusiasm. I mean, these were disgusting, vile women. I mean, they went around shaming. Uh, you know, men in the streets with white feathers. They visited Russia, the Kerensky government. They talked about the battalions of death and how we needed those, uh, you know, in Britain. Some women supported the war with absolute vengeance. To be honest, Sylvia Pankhurst, you know, uh, she stood out. Uh, and there had been a war, uh, uh, an anti, uh, a big anti-war movement prior to the First World War, which unfortunately did dissipate. You know, once everyone talked about Little Bill, Belgium, you know, Peter, men flocked. Sylvia Panker stands out as an absolute beacon. I mean, she had 10,000 in a rally in the Albert Hall on the eve of the First World War. But what is marvellous about Sylvia Pankhurst at this time is that she connects anti-war with the real conditions of women in the East End of London. She chooses totally against her class background to go and work with the most impoverished women. You know, she sets up the East London Federation of Suffragettes. And then she really, be, you know, changes that from the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was the Women's Dreadnought and it be the paper that she produced and it becomes uh, the Workers' Dreadnought. She was steeped in class struggle. She twins East London, uh, the suffragette group with the miners on strike in Wales. She spoke on the platform uh, with Jim Larkin on the D Dublin uh, lockout. She recognised she, she wasn't a pacifist. She melted together anti-war opposition and the struggle, or tried to, you know, the struggle of working uh, class uh, people. I mean, I'm glad that Roddy spoke really about the rent strikes in 1915, uh, uh, because he's absolutely right, these were all, all pr well, ex all exclusively, it, this was a campaign amongst women. The whole question about the state of housing, because of the strikes that had proceeded and the lack of building, it was a very, very important step into rent controls and the notion 
of social housing. I mean, it was out of that strike that they really won the first um, social housing. But I also then just want to finish on, I mean, I think that in some ways the kind of points that Jeannie raised. I mean, I think it is actually quite interesting, you know, that, what was it, was it a year ago that Cameron announced that really we were going to revit, we were going to embark on the 100th anniversary of the First World War. And he was going to try to ideologically change it, wasn't he? He was going to bring in a new sort of patriotism. He was going to wipe away all the memories of Wilfred Owen and the trenches and the, and the horror. And they haven't managed to do it. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, you don't see anywhere really, in any extent, they cannot rewrite the level of carnage that was experienced. And well done, you know, when you were talking about, you know, in Sheffield, uh, the newspapers, uh, you know, the stories, the postcards, the letters. And if there's anything that's kind of missing, I think, in the history of women, is that, though I did notice there's a novel downstairs on the bookstore, I don't think there is enough written about really how, men, how women did manage after the men came back with the social and emotional and the physical. I mean, you know, Roddy's right, you know, how these women coped, ordinary women coped in, you know, in circumstances of material deprivation with men who had been, you know, eternally damaged emotionally, socially, and physically, and there's so little, and if anyone does, please tell me, because I think there's so little written about how they coped on their, in their personal uh, relationships with men um, it, after that. But again, just really to, talk, to, to end, uh, because Jeannie was talking about um, the contradictions, um, I talked about the legislation <coughs> that had returned women, the restoration of the Pre-War Practices Act, which was passed in 1919, but actually not many people talk about another piece of legislation which was passed a month later in 1919, which was called the Sex Disqualif Disqualification Removal Act. And it was the first piece of equality legislation ever passed in Britain. And what it did was it removed the barriers I mean, le the legal barriers that many predominantly middle class women had faced in the professions. So it, may, it, it opened up in medicine, in the civil service, in law. It was illegal after 1919. I mean, obviously with reservations, because we know, you know, they never really got equal status to much later. But it meant that a whole tranche of middle class women were able to enter middle class professions that they'd never um, entered, uh, weren't allowed to enter before. So at the same time you have them trying to push women back into the home, they have to recognise that in a whole number of areas, um, you know, there is, um, they, they had to open, um, you know, these areas up. And certainly, you know, with things like midwifery and health visiting, obviously those were predominantly jobs that middle class women did. You had to have a certain level of education, you had to have a certain, num a certain amount of financial background to be able to endure and maintain yourself through the training. So middle class women gained an enormous amount. Some people might argue, some people do argue in the books, they gained more than a lot of uh, working class women. But certainly, you know, I think we're all agreed, you know, capitalism has its enormous uh, contradictions, uh, but for women's lives, they will never, were never the same. Okay.